Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, you know, last year, my colleague Frank Frankowski was here talking to you guys about the motivation behind how we started this open source project called Open Compute. And what I wanted to do today is actually walk you through some of the progress that we've made and some of the interesting things that are going on. So when we launched for Open Compute about two years ago, um, it was just us, right? So it was just Facebook. Facebook contributed three pieces of technology, a data center design, rack design, and also power management. But it was just us, and most of the world was like, what the heck are you doing? Um, but the core of these three designs, or the sort of the value of these three pieces that we contributed, actually contributed to our infrastructure and made an impact such that we were 38% more energy efficient and we lowered our cost by 24% in our data center compared to a leased facility of the same. And as you might know, we're building out really rapidly to keep up with the 1.1 billion users around the world that are using Facebook today. So this made a really, really big financial as well as energy consumption uh, impact to us. Now, the thing that I'm most actually proud of is in the last year, uh, open computers actually become a lot more. Right? So now we actually have thousands of people involved with the Open Compute Summits, with the, workshop, or the, the programs. We also have 60 plus companies involved in contributing to, uh, to the project. Uh, we have dozens of technical uh, contributions that have been um, added to and, and run by the foundation. We've also internationalized. We've got chapters started in Hong Kong and Tokyo as well. So there's a lot happening here, um, and Facebook has moved from being sort of a majority piece of open compute to actually just a major contributor not running the show. We've also uh, established a board run by five uh, organizations and Andy um, so that we actually can steer this foundation of open compute um, for the future. Now, Here's a flavor of the types of companies that are involved here and that have come out over the last year, year and a half to join and work on open compute. Now, the thing that I actually find is um, just the quality and the caliber of the companies here. We're still focused on data center, data center technology, server technology, storage, and then uh, network, which is a new project that we just recently launched. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Recently, actually, a couple of venture firms got together and created a fund um, called the Open Incubate Fund. And what this is, fund is designed is actually to, it's aimed at startups who are building on infrastructure and products that are based on open stack and also open compute. So it's not only just about the big companies anymore, it's actually um, kind of seeped in and actually has this startup in sort of an entrepreneurial sense to it as well. Okay. So, you know, when we first kicked off um, open compute a couple years ago, um, we really wanted to spark a conversation and collaboration around building more efficient and flexible data center infrastructure. But I always saw it as an essential response to this rapid flood of data that is coming our way. Everybody here is dealing with lots of data, lots of applications, lots of changes in the infrastructure. So, you know, for us, it's been um, a kind of well-timed in terms of working on this stuff to deal with our applications and also our data. But you know, why is this all important? I think for me, I look at what's coming and looking at some of the data about big data, it's pretty insane, right? So in 2010, there was about uh, 800 exabytes of data or 0 0.8 zettabytes of data created in 2010. Now, fast forward just two years later, and in 2012, we had 2.8 zettabytes of data on the planet. So two zettabytes were created in just two years. Now, some analysts are looking at this and saying, hey, by 2020, we're going to be at 40 zettabytes of data. Now, if you take all of that data, put it on three terabyte drives, line them up end to end, you'd be able to go to the moon back and forth twice. Right? So it's a lot of data that's coming our way. And the fascinating thing about this, or the most worrisome thing to me, is that these estimates are always wrong. Right? We will probably get there way, way, way sooner, and the challenges sort of keep increasing over time. So, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to keep working together on this. Um, the gap that we have in terms of the solutions um, we have today and where we need to be is just growing and working together in this community, not only in open source software, which you know, we're going to be talking about a lot in this conference, but also in the physical infrastructure, in the servers, in the data center, networking, storage, et cetera, is really got to come together for us to actually, um, I guess, keep up, with these, keep up with these challenges. 
So I want to deep dive into two projects that we're working on in Open Compute to give you a flavor of sort of two things I'm pretty excited about. Now, there's dozens more, so I'm just going to talk about two things that are kind of recent. Um, and you know, check, check out the, the site and the project if you want to learn more about other projects. So to set some context up for the first project I want to walk through, um, a couple years ago, this is kind of how we envisioned the data center stack looking. You see, uh, you know, obviously Linux and, and um, HDFS being uh, pretty common uh, things in our infrastructure. Um, OpenStack, I guess, is celebrating its third birthday today or tomorrow. I can't remember. Um, so you know, this is all coming together, but we had a lot of other kind of pieces in the puzzle that were proprietary things. We didn't have a lot of choices. We didn't have a lot of insight in terms of how to build the infrastructure in the data center. Now, the work that has happened over the last couple years in open compute, there you go, um, has sort of opened up the, the data center stack here for us. Now, you can see the contributions of things across the data center, uh, rack design, open rack, the things that we've done in servers. We've created a motherboard that actually is vendor agnostic, so you can plug and play different uh, CPU architectures in there. There's also the work that we've done around rack interconnects around servers as well, so you can have a 100 gig uh, backplane across your, data, uh, your servers within your rack. Now, What's fascinating to me, though, is that here we're still kind of black, uh, we're still blocked by a couple of black boxes in our infrastructure. So, what we did was actually kind of look at this and say, hey, you know, for us, we've got all of this stuff that we're doing in all these layers of the stack here, but we're still routing all of these packets through these closed proprietary boxes that were not designed and built for running at the scale that we're all having to deal with because of the data that we have to face today. So, with that in mind, um, back in May, we kicked off a new project and added it to Open Compute. It's a networking project. And the idea behind this project specifically is that we're going to work together, and these organizations are uh, focused on creating a reference implementation, but eventually a, a sort of a, uh, a vendor agnostic switch so that we can actually run and separate the hardware from the software and so that you'll be able to create um, kind of and build uh, a very customized networking fabric that you need for your infrastructure here. So the idea is that we want to be able to separate, again, the hardware from the software, be able to give uh, all of us infrastructure builders more choice, and then be able to use that uh, construction and that, uh, those, that customization ability so that we can better manage, better deploy, better operate, better monitor, better configure these network devices within our infrastructure. Um, so decoupling of this is going to be really, really important. We got a great response. Back in May, we held an engineering summit around this project at MIT. We had 100 engineers come and hack on the spec and work on sort of thinking about the reference implementation. In a couple of weeks, August 13th in Santa Clara, we're going to all get together and we're going to beat up the spec and also the charter of this group. So we're picking up steam here in terms of uh, people working on this problem. So if you're interested in this, uh, please join us. Again, August 13th in Santa Clara. OK, so uh, let's see. There we go. Um, the next project I want to jump into is actually what I call cold storage for photos. So Facebook Photos is the largest uh, photo sharing site on the world today. Um, it, is the most, it is one of the most engaging and sort of one of the most used features on the site today. To give you some context in terms of the scale we deal with today, we have over 250 billion photos that have been uploaded by people around the world. We get 350 million new photos every day. And on a crazy holiday like Halloween or New Year's Eve, we will get anywhere from 1 to 1.5 billion photos in a single 24-hour period. On average, we're consuming about 7 petabytes of storage just in photo storage uh, per month. Right? So this is just a massive scale problem. And this is something we've been constantly chasing. Right? This problem doesn't get easier for us, because every time we think we got it nailed, somebody goes and changes something in the product and unlocks something, and we get a whole dump load more of photos. And they increase the size. They do image processing, all of this stuff. So it's always uh, a, con a continual ba ba battle for us. Now, it's fascinating to me to kind of look at the problem statement, because on one hand, we can't lose any of the photos, right? These are the precious memories of people around the world, and we can't lose them. Um, however, we have to store this on lots of servers uh, as we get more and more photos, and this costs us lots and lots of money. 
On the other hand, we have to preserve a fast user experience. So I can't take all of the photos that you uploaded last year, put them on tape, and bury them in a shed somewhere. Um, so I have to keep these things online. And because of that, we have to actually expend and, and use up a lot of power to keep this stuff fast and to keep the latency down uh, to a minimal amount. But there is actually some hope here. So we looked at this. And we said, OK, um, on the x-axis here is the photo age in months. And on the, and the green line here is the distribution of our traffic to those photos. And as you might expect, that photos that are more recent in the system have more interactions in the system. right? This is pretty straightforward. But I never realized until we looked at this data how extreme it was. right? It is really, really extreme in that um, this, the shape of this curve. Now, there's another line here, which just gives you a rough distribution by age of the total number of photos in the system. And it's pretty linear here. right? So it, it'll eventually get to 100%, but that will take you nine years to get there. Um, so when you intersect these graphs, what I found interesting and in in, in what we used to start working on our solution here was that 82% of our traffic, so 82% of the reads and the interactions that are happening on photos today are actually only focused on 8% of the total photos in the system, right? 8% of 250 billion plus photos. So that means that well over 200 billion photos on the site today are not really that interactive or not viewed that often, right? But the big problem here for us in the past was that we stored all of these photos, these 92% photos, on the same infrastructure as we stored the 8%, right? So we're, we're uh, wasting all this energy. We had all of this really sophisticated software, really sophisticated data center, really sophisticated server design to basically store this stuff that was never really being interacted and actually being uh, served that often. So we had to do better. Um, my CFO said I had to do better. Um, so we came up with a solution. Now, in true Facebook fashion, uh, we looked at this problem and we said, OK, well, we can't just change the software. You know, we can't just make some changes in the product, do some fancier compression, uh, play around with some things here. We really had to look at the full stack. So we had to think about it from the ground up. Um, and we looked at the data center, we looked at the software, and we looked at the server design. And I'm going to take you through our solution. All right, so first up is the data center design. We ended up designing a data center and building a custom data center for cold storage. The design points of the data center are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum of our, com our compute-heavy data centers. So today, for the cold storage uh, facility, we're going to be able to store one exabyte per data hall. Um, each data hall will be roughly about 1.5 megawatts in size, store about 500 racks of servers. Um, and it's an important thing here that we did to, to reduce cost here is we cut out all of the redundancy. There's no UPSs, there's no generators, there's no extra stuff in this, uh, in this facility. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a quick picture down in the lower bottom right. Hopefully you can see it. There's an L-shaped building. That is the cold storage building um, actually being constructed nearby over here in Prineville, Oregon. Um, it's next to the regular compute-heavy um, data centers, which are the two other buildings there. And for the cold storage building, you can see the spine on the far right, and then the data hall is extending out to the left. And we have one data hall built. We'll build out uh, data hall two and data hall three eventually as we need it. Each, again, each one is one exabyte in terms of size. OK, so now moving on to the software. So we cut out all the generators. We cut out all the um, UPSs. We um, simplified everything. It's really, really cheap. Um, but we had to, we, it, wasn't, it was a, a zero-sum game. So we had to actually push a lot of the uh, sort of complexity and sort of sophistication of this into the software. It's a pretty hard challenge. We have to deal with a massive scale. We have to make sure we don't lose stuff. Um, we have to have high throughput because there's a lot of data that's going to be stored and moving around in this facility, and it has to be efficient, right? If this thing turns out to be more expensive uh, than the other solution, then my CFO fires me. Um, so, you know, some other constraints here that are pretty, I think, hard for us, which is one is there is no power redundancy, as I mentioned. We have to make sure we don't blow out the breakers if we spin up everything at one time to suck out data or to move data around in the facility. We also have to make sure that we don't blow out the network fabric, right? Because we actually have a, um, a lot of bits that we need, may need to move around. And so we want to make sure that we don't blow out the network as, as part of this. Now, there's some also hard problems, and I'll get into it in a bit with the servers, is that one is based on the type of media that we're putting in there, the, the storage devices themselves, we have to be able to tolerate a higher failure rate than we would anywhere else in our facility. We have to be able to deal with heterogeneous types of storage racks. We aren't going to just be running um, disks forever and the same type of disk forever. 
And we also have to make sure that we're managing the power. Again, we have to look at the aggregate power by rack, by row, and for the whole data center here. Um, let's see here. Oops. Let's go back one. Here we go. OK. Um, so here's the server design that we have uh, come up with for cold storage. Um, the servers here, uh, you can see a sort of a rendition here on the right of what the rack looks like. This rack has eight times more storage than our conventional storage rack. Um, we will have about two petabytes per rack to start out with, and it only takes two kW. So it's one fourth the power of a normal storage rack for us. Um, and it has 10 gig backplane inside the rack and 40 gigs outside the rack. Now, what's key about this is that um, it's also built in OpenRack. So OpenRack is another project that has been done by the community within Open, uh, uh, Open Compute. And so we can plug and play and change the ratio of compute to storage nodes here. The rendition here on, this, on, the, on the slide here has two compute nodes and 30 storage shelves. But we can change that um, if we need to over time. OK, so there's some other options that have been explored here um, for the actual storage media itself. We've looked at uh, you know, things like tape. We've looked at other types of disk drive technology, uh, desktop drives, um, SMR shingled media stuff. Um, the one thing that I'm actually pretty excited about is looking at lower grade flash for this type of use case. And I'm calling it cold flash. And what we're looking for is low write endurance flash that can be actually used to store this, uh, this content. We want to minimize the power that we need, but we also have, basically, with this use case, large sequential writes and random reads. So if we can find and work with the community in open compute to develop lower grade flash, um, give us the, the sort of the storage capacity, and also give us a really, really low cost point, then we can actually potentially use this and further optimize the economics and also the power efficiency for this cold storage solution. So this stuff is already happening in Open Compute. We're having conversations with folks, and there's a lot of um, collaboration that's already kicking off on this. OK, so. You know, we put this whole thing together, and uh, how did we fare? So our solution ended up being one-third the cost on the storage racks themselves. So um, we really kind of hit the, hit the mark here in terms of saving money on the dollars per gig unit. Also, on the data center side, we are actually one-fifth the cost of our conventional data center. Most of this was because we threw away all the extra stuff, right? And we said, hey, all that redundancy and all that uh, power and all that uh, special cooling that we do in the main data centers, we don't need any of that. It's simple, simple, simple. And we were able to throw away a bunch of uh, costs out of the system. Okay, so it's not a bad start, but we're just getting started. We are sharing what we can um, with this solution, and over time, we expect this to be something that everybody's got to deal with in terms of uh, big data problems. So with that, um, hopefully I gave you guys a good flavor of what Open Compute is and how we've moved to it being just a Facebook-led and launched initiative to actually being something that a really broad community of people and organizations all around the world are working on together. Now, listen, I'm not a hardware guy. I you know, have been uh, mostly focused on software uh, most of my career. But I do find this stuff extremely cool to geek out on. Right? When you can think about your software problems, your application problems, your data problems, and think about it through the whole stack, um, you really get to go and create some, uh, some really, really cool things. Now, I also don't know about you guys, but um, you know, it's really hard for me to predict what Mark, our CEO, uh, is going to want from an application and a data perspective a year from now, not even a month from now. Right? It's, it's something that we're constantly changing, we're constantly iterating. We're building this infrastructure, though, to last for years. Right? It's not like we're um, recomposing our infrastructure every day. Um, we're having to build it, set it in place. So even though I focused on efficiency as being a really big tenant for what we're working on, flexibility is an equally important thing that the Open Compute project and the community around it is working on. We want to maximize the amount of uh, flexibility that we have so that we can adapt to all the changing requirements of the applications and the data over time. So I wanted to highlight both efficiency and flexibility, and also the community is working on both of this stuff. So if you're interested and want to help us out, please join us. Um, and uh, there's some URLs here if you uh, care to check it out. Thank you.